in the presentation and the documents that will be discussed today. And uh, without any further ado, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Chamberlain for taking time out of his busy day. And, and I would like to introduce Dr. Chamberlain. So Ken Chamberlain received his PhD from Ohio University, specializing in computational electromagnetics. His research has been devoted to modeling radio wave propagation, including interfering radiation from computing devices and wave phenomena in the human body. Dr. Chamberlain is the past chair and professor emeritus in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. In his more than 35 years in academia, he has performed research for more than 25 sponsors, including the National Science Foundation. He has received two Fulbright awards, including the prestigious Fulbright Distinguished Chair, which he served in Aviero, Portugal. He has also served as an associate editor for the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and he continues to be active in performing research and publishing. Dr. Chamberlain, the floor is yours. You should be able to do a screen share on your presentation. Fantastic. Thank you. And thank you for the introduction, Mr. Willis, and thank you to the board for the invitation. I think the first thing I want to point out is that I'm not here just representing myself. I'm here as a representative of the New Hampshire Commission. It was formed to study the health and environmental impacts of 5G and wireless technology. So this is what I'm showing you are the findings of a commission. Having mentioned commission, I think I should say a little bit about what that commission was and how it was formed. I didn't know myself until I joined the commission. But basically in the New Hampshire, in order to form a state commission, you need to have support from the legislature. So somebody had to write a bill, a senator and a representative. That bill then got voted on by the full legislature and was finally signed by the governor. So this isn't just something that somebody said, let's cobble together a commission. It was formed through legislation. And the legislation was pretty specific about who should be on the commission because we wanted to have enough people with enough expertise to really address the situation, the, the question uh, adequately to have the, the necessary background. So in the final analysis, we had 13 commission members. Backgrounds included physics, toxicology, electromagnetics, epidemiology, biostatistics, occupational health, medicine, public health policy, business and law. So in the final analysis, we had a commission comprised of people who could really answer the question, who had the expertise in the background to answer it. And so we met over a period of year, a year, and we heard from nine experts in the field relating to cell phone radiation and health effects. And I point out to kind of give you a, a little bit of a sense of what we're, some of the things we're going to talk about. I should note that all but one of the experts that came to speak to the commission were unpaid. And the only expert that was paid was somebody paid for by the telecommunications industry. And that expert was the only person to say that cell phone radiation was not a problem. And you'll find that is true, and I'll be mentioning that more later on. Now, the finding of the commission, oops. The finding of the commission uh, was that, well, you don't want to hear this, but cell phone radiation is indeed harmful. Now. No, none of us want to hear this. We're in a time when it seems like everything can kill us. If it's not COVID, now it's our cell phones. But the good news here is that there are things that we can do to protect ourselves against that radiation, but we have to acknowledge that it's a problem first. So in my presentation, yes, I'll identify some of the concerns, but I'll also talk about some of the solutions, and there are many. We have great technology, and it just means that things might cost a little bit more. So the other thing that we found out is that this is not at this point a scientific issue. The science is pretty clear, and that's one of the things I'll be going over with you today. So the science is clear about the health risks of exposure to radiation, cell phone radiation, but um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's mostly political at this point, what's keeping us from moving forward, and I'll address some of those issues too. Um, I think I need a, a conflict of interest statement at this point. And that statement is that I'm coming to you free. 
I'm not charging anything, you know, is because of my, my work on the commission that I am now have a good background experience. Also, because I've worked in electromagnetics my entire career, I understand the technology and I can speak to that technology and how it impacts people. So when I was uh, joined this, the commission, I was a professor and chair, I'm, I'm now retired, uh, but I was a professor and chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in, at the University of New Hampshire. And as such, my bias, if anything, is for technology. I've seen the great things that technology can do. So it's not like I came onto the commission thinking, nah, nah, I'm gonna poo-poo this. I didn't feel that at all. In fact, what I thought is that we would find that there were no concerns, we would be done, and then we would be able to go home and declare victory. But that wasn't the case. We looked through the peer-reviewed journals, we looked through, and I'll be showing you some of that later on, we talked to experts and we came to the conclusion that no, this is a concern, people need to know about it, and we need to address that issue. Uh, I just, uh, more on the line of my background, uh, I served for the, in, uh, on the board of the Interoperability Laboratory, which is an international evaluator of wireless and wired technologies. Again, not something that somebody would do if they were anti-technology, I'm not. I was an active in Project 54, which uh, addresses the communication needs of police and first responders. I was very involved in that effort. Uh, I'm serving as the vice chair for the Virtual Learning Academy Charter School. The point I'm trying to make here is that going into this, I was, if, if anything, my bias was towards technology, and that's true for most, almost all of the board members. So um, I just uh, want to highlight again that it was because of my service that I've been asked to make presentations like the one I'm making to you today, and I'm not getting paid for it. I come to you as a fellow citizen with awareness of a concern of a health risk that you should know about. And the only people that I've run into so far that say that cell phone radiation is harmless are people affiliated with the cell phone industry. And I'll leave it at that. Dr. Chamberlain, were you planning on showing the presentation? Because it's not up. No, I'm, I'm going to show it actually starting right now. But okay, thank, you. thank you. That's something that we all can do. So I'm now going to go and share uh, my, my slides. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Would you let me in, please, through security? You're now a co-host. Fantastic. Thank you. Do it. So let me talk about a little bit about what I'm going to do in this presentation. We have limited time, and I know that there are specific an uh, questions that you want to have answered. So I do have some preliminaries slides that address some very basic issues, and I'd like to go through them. I'm going to go through them a little bit quickly, and I'm going to do that with the understanding that we can come back to those slides if I didn't appropriately or adequately answer your question to begin with. So having said that, let's go through some of the commonly asked questions, and I'll try to point out the highlights. Basically, why are we concerned about the placement of cell towers? And the answer is pretty clear. There is a growing body of information or of evidence demonstrating that exposure to cell phone type radiation is harmful. And so what's meant by cell phone radiation? Well, that's basically digital radiation in general. So all of the devices that you have, and these devices only have been around for perhaps 20 years, these digital devices, they send digital information, zeros and ones. And what makes them different? By the way, all radiation is of concern, but digital radiation is of greater concern because of its impulsive nature. So what happens is that you can see here's an example of receiving a phone call on your, on your digital device, on your phone. And that is you have little spikes of energy. And the way a biochemist that I talked to recently describes those bursts of energy, it's like a jackhammer on your cells. Your cells are basically electromagnetic in nature. Your brain is very basically electromagnetic in nature. So when you have this digital type radiation, it's more harmful to you physically than the, the more the radiation we may have been familiar with from 30 years ago, like just FM radio and AM radio stations. They were of concern, but not as much concern as with cell phone type radiation. Other things, uh, the difference between different signals, and again, I'm going to point out just the 
important things that you need to know. One difference between different devices, different digital devices, are the, are the amount of power that is given. So different power levels, and I'm going to give these power levels because they're, they kind of give you a sense of the relative risk of the various devices. Bluetooth, it's 100 milliwatts, and a milliwatt is one one thousandth of a watt. So yeah, that's a concern. Smart meters are of great concern because they're transmitting almost continuously and they have a pretty high power output, close to a watt. Cell phones themselves are very strong radiators uh, from you know, 0.6 watts or 600 milliwatts up to three watts. You know, it's a fair amount of power. And finally, cell towers, they can go from 10 to 50 watts. So those are very strong radiators. They're radiating digital information and they're radiating well, pretty much all continuously, as opposed to your cell phone that radiates only occasionally. So that's why, why we're particularly concerned about cell towers and their placement. Uh, just radiation from all of these devices pose a health risk. There are people, I mean, in fact, somebody's on the line, Cecilia Doucette, CC Doucette, who can show you how to reduce exposure from those devices, but that's not the purpose of my presentation today. But if you'd like to know more about it, she can help you. And, and by the way, I should also point out that I'm linked, and with these slides, I've linked a lot of the information. So when you get the slides, they're going to be in PDF format, and all I have to do is click on the links provided, and it'll take you to the source of the information that I'm presenting to you today. But here's what comes to something that I uh, know you are interested in, and that is what do cell phone, or what does an antenna do? What does any antenna do? And the answer is that basically they act like a flashlight X, or most antennas do. So here's my very rough drawing of a flashlight. And I hope you guys can uh, envision the flashlight from what I drew. So you turn the flashlight on and you get a beam of energy out. So I can represent the beam of energy using this figure. And so, by the way, light is electromagnetic energy. So this is a very good analogy. So a directional antenna, like the type used on cell towers, act like a flashlight in the fact that it directs energy in a particular direction. Now, the key thing to note here also is an antenna does not change the frequency or the information contained in the signal. It's still the same signal, just like light isn't changed when you put a reflector behind it and aim it in a particular direction. So we're going to be talking about antennas, and this is really all you need to know. I could go into great detail about how they work, but I'd bore you to tears if I did. So let's take a look at some antenna patterns. And right now, for this figure right here, we're taking a top view of three directional antennas. I assume that they would be mounted on a mast. And you can see here that we have one antenna pointing towards the north. Keep in mind, this is a top view. One towards the southeast, one towards the southwest. And the reason cell companies do this, and you, you've all seen cell towers and you've seen antennas located like this, is that you now can talk to more customers at the same time. So people in region one would only see what's being transmitted by that antenna, by antenna number one. People in this region right here would only see antenna two, etc. So these antennas are very important for putting the signals where you want it. This is a top-down view, and you've seen what they look like on the mast. If you look at a side view of this, the uh, this is, you know, from the, the side view, and it's, uh, it looks at the elevation pattern. What happens is the signal is directed in a particular direction in elevation. Now, one reason you would want to do this is you certainly want to wouldn't want to radiate like this because you don't have any cell phone users in that direction. So what is typically done is you will take it, put an antenna on a high mass, aim the signal down so that it hits where you want coverage area. So that's the general idea. Um, I, I think that we can, if that's okay with you guys, I'm trying to look at your faces to see what you're, whether or not this is making sense to you. But I can continue and pretty soon I'll be getting to something that's directly relevant to the question that I'm, that's, that I'm trying to answer in today's presentation. Here are some actual antenna patterns. And this came from a site, this is from York, Maine. It's a proposed facility from AT&T. And here's, remember, this is the top view right here. And you get a pattern that's typically pretty broad. You 
can have it of being a little bit narrower, but for this particular configuration, you're only going to be reaching people in a region out here. And you might on that same mass put a similar antenna pointing the other direction to get coverage both, right, both ways. So this is what your azimuth pattern looks like. And that's in, again, for, for north, south, east, and west. And the other pattern is the elevation pattern. And this is very important for the discussion today, this elevation pattern right here. So note that in this case, you have most of the energy going here along at this angle right here. It, it typically would be along the horizon. And you have substantial radiation down here. So yes, antenna patterns in the elevation plane can pump most of the energy out in a particular direction, but there is, it's very difficult, very challenging and expensive to be able to build antennas that are highly directional. In other words, when I've seen the, uh, the artist's conception of an antenna pattern provided by the cell industry, they show something like this really narrow beam and that just, they don't exist. So, what I want to do next is take a breath and now get to answering the question that I suspect, well, I, I, I was asked to provide an answer to, and that is this site right here. Here's the Curtis building. You all know it, or I suspect you all know it, and you can see the surrounding building. And as I understand it, what is being proposed is they're going to go on to a chimney or something like that and put up a tower is going to be put in, or not a tower, they're going to put up an antenna that's going to provide coverage for much of the town, or perhaps you know, a lot more of the town. So as you look at this, I want to mention to you, give you a little sense of my background, my career, over 40 years, I've spent looking at scenarios like this. And that is, if you have a particular configuration, the configuration of this, the buildings, you have a particular antenna placement with a particular antenna pattern, what signal are you going to receive? Well, that's what computational electromagnetics is all about, and it involves putting this information into a computer, letting it plug and crank, and getting the answer. So I'm really familiar with how much of a signal you'd receive. Now, one thing that was said is that I, or at least I've heard people say, and this is people from the telecom industry, and that is if you have your antenna here, you're going to, it's going to be so narrow that it's going to project the energy out to the horizon. Now, if you think about this a little bit, that's kind of ridiculous because if you have a narrow beam of energy and it goes out to the horizon, it's not going to hit your customers. You're not going to get reception. So that's kind of ridiculous to suggest that you would have a beam so, so thin then it's going to go out to the horizon. No. Let's take a look at what is realistic, though, and let's put our antenna pattern, this site right here, where we intend to, put, or where the intention is to put an antenna. So here's what the pattern would look like. Clearly, the main radiation is going to be in this direction right here, perhaps towards the horizon. However, you've got substantial radiation that's going down. Uh, admittedly, this is a log plot, and these signals are pretty far down, but you are so close to uh, the antenna that you're going to have very strong radiation in this direction. Now, I understand that they thought about putting a, an antenna like this on the building, on the Curtis building, 20 years ago, and they decided not to because they were concerned that the radiation from the antennas would cause problems with the medical instrumentation and pacemakers. And they were right. They decided not to do it. And I hope that's the case for now, because putting an antenna on would produce very strong radiation in the building. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about why that is. So you see that you have you know, strong radiation here, and you have radiation that's going to illuminate this building right here. Is that City Hall? So you're going to get strong radiation towards City Hall. And one thing that I definitely can tell you, and that is at these frequencies, at cell phone frequencies, even rough surfaces, rough to the eye, are pretty reflective because of the, the size of the wavelength. They're reflective at cell phone frequencies. So what would happen and what will happen if you put an antenna there is you're going to get reflection. It'll strike the building. Now, some of it, a lot of energy will go into that building. But remember, this is a very strong signal. It's going to reflect back, hit the street, reflect back here, and you're going to get significant radiation inside the building. You can't avoid it. 
Um, other factors that you need to know about is, I'm going to remove the antenna there, the Henry pattern, is look at this edge right here. This edge or edges go all the way around buildings. And so if you have an antenna here, signal from the antenna will illuminate that edge. And perhaps you've heard of knife edge diffraction. And so uh, what's going to happen is that energy is going to diffract around and get radiated into the building. The bottom line here is if you put an antenna on a building like this, you're going to get major significant radiation inside the building. But hey, do I have to go through all this analysis to answer that question? Don't we know from previous experience what has happened in other facilities? The answer is yes. Go to California. And in, in that case, they put antennas on or near. So in this case, on fire stations. Here they put tower uh, antennas near it on a mast. These were directional antennas that were supposed to you know, take the energy away from the antenna so it wouldn't radiate the people inside the building. So we have examples of what's happened in the past. And I hope this is an example that doesn't get repeated in Curtis, because let's look at what happened to them. What happened when cell towers were placed in stations, on fire stations? Let me read this if you don't mind, and that is within a week of installation, many firefighters developed unusual symptoms of headaches, fatigue, insomnia, memory loss, confusion, nausea, and weakness. After a time, firefighters in stations with adjacent cell towers were found to have forgotten CPR or became lost responding to a fire in the city where they grew up. Now, one thing I want to point out is, do you recognize these symptoms from anything nearby you? Talk to the people in Pittsfield. That's what they reported too. A cell tower got put in, a cell tower got turned on, and these are the symptoms that they had. These are symptoms typical, and I'll show you a scientific study on these symptoms in just a little bit. It's also kind of insidious that you have problems like this because you can look at those symptoms and say, well, gosh, isn't that part of everyday life? And yeah, there are other things that can cause that. But cell phone radiation, cell tower radiation are things that can definitely cause it. And here's just an example of it. This is what happened in California. So another question. So I'm going to now talk about a solution. So the one, one thing I am saying to you based upon my experience is if you put the antenna on a, the Curtis building, you're going to have major amounts of radiation that's going to affect not only the Curtis building, but nearby buildings. And in fact, <laughs> within a radius of perhaps 300 to 500 meters. So in order to talk about a solution, I need to talk about how the signal strength varies. And notice I'm using a word here, power density. It's going to have units of watts per meter squared, because that's how we rate it. You, you're familiar with watts. You know, you have a, a refrigerator that uses so many watts. Well, when you're talking about electromagnetics, you're talking about watts per meter squared. That's how you rate ten power density. So there is an equation. This is the only equation that I have in my pres presentation. Sigh of relief. But let's talk about what this equation means in practical terms. Let's say you're sitting at your desk, you've got your cell phone on your desk, one meter away from you. And let's assume that at that one meter, it provides a power density at you of one milliwatt. Remember, milli is a thousandths, one milliwatt per meter squared. And this isn't, this is in the ballpark of the type of radiation you would see. Now, if you pull that phone a little bit closer to a half meter, what happens is you've have the distance, but now you have four times the amount of power density on you. So the point I'm making here is that distance is your friend when it comes to radiation. You've got to get away from the source to have reasonable and safe amounts of radiation. Now, if you put it in your back pocket, as so many of us have done, so if you put it in your back pocket, you're going to get huge amounts of radiation. And so uh, notice here that you're going to be over a kilowatt per meter squared, huge radiation exposure by having it close to your body. And if <laughs> please don't do this, this is definitely not a good idea because it's touching your body. So this drop off in power density is one over R squared, and it's something that you need to take into account when you're considering radiation. So here's where we are. 
you're looking down on this is probably going to look familiar to you. Here is the Curtis building that I've put in the center and I've put a ring around the Curtis building at 500 meters. And the reason that I'm using 500 meters is that is the setback that the New Hampshire Commission recommended for cell phones, for cell towers. And so what that means is that your t entire town is within the setback region, which is mean it's, means it's within the region that we're saying you should stay out of. And I'll show you where we came up with that 500 meter setback in just a moment. By the way, as you, I think you can see here, is that 500 meters is 1,640 feet. So if you put the antennas on the Curtis building, you're going to be putting everybody in the town within a region that's been identified as being at risk. So what can you do about it? So the answer, and I'm going to just, I'm going to propose something. This is an example. I'm not saying this is what you should do, but if you want to protect the people in the town of Lenox, you want to go out a distance away. And I'm not saying this is the one, but you want to go out a distance and put up a tall tower. Something that would have an antenna pattern like this, it would give you complete and very in, in good coverage within the town of Lenox and beyond that. Cell phone radiation or the towers can, can reach areas from 5 to 20 miles, depending on what your needs are and depending on the location of the tower. So you could put go out away from town, put up a tower, a tall tower, put an antenna, a directional antenna on it, you'd get great coverage area. And it wouldn't, you know, nobody would be exposed to excessive radiation. So now we got to talk a little bit about the business of this. Why do cell companies want you to believe that cell phone radiation is harmless? Well, the reason is, if it's harmless, they could go ahead, put the antenna right here on the Curtis building, turn up the power so that they get the desired 5 to 20 mile coverage area, People on the cover, outskirts of the coverage area would get fine reception, but you would be you know, adding or putting people here at very high risk because of that strong radiation. So let's look at the, the economics of this. If they can simply drive into town with their antennas, put them on top of the Curtis building, hook up the antennas, that costs them very, very little. But if they do the alternative and they go here and put in an antenna right here, an antenna mast, they have to pay for the mast to begin with. They have to buy the property. They have to put in access roads. They have to run power. So we're talking perhaps several hundred thousand dollars. So what I see happening and what we saw in the commission is it seems that cell installers, cell companies are willing to jeopardize the health of people just to save some money. And you've seen this type of thing before, and I'm going to show you why this is not just an opinion or even an opinion within the commission, but we have evidence to suggest this is true, and I'll be showing you that in, in just a moment. So one thing I'm going to go quickly on this slide right here, and that is a question that you need to know the answer to, and is what type of power density? Now, I've talked about power density, but what power density do you need to make a good phone call? So I'm just going to get down here to a good phone call, and I'm going to show here that you can get three to four bars with a, a very small signal. You notice here this N, that's nanowatts. That's 10 to the minus ninth, a billionth of a watt. Uh, and so what you can have a very robust phone call for one billionth of the FCC limit. But the reason they want to keep their standards, or not standards, they want to keep their threshold, their exposure threshold so high, is so that they can go into a town like Lenox, put in a single antenna, get desired radiation, it'll be a cheap installation, and they're done. And they go on and do it somewhere else. I just wanted to mention that, that you don't need a very strong signal to have a very robust phone call. So, a key question, and I remember I said that the New Hampshire, we decided that a setback of 500 meters was, was appropriate. And so the question that you need to know, and you need to know where you probably want to know, is where did that information come from? Why did they decide on that? And to answer that question, I'm going to bring up a study. And I'm going to spend a little time describing this study. It was done in uh, <laughs> it was done in Brazil about ten, uh, in over a 10-year period of time. And the way the study worked is they 
by looking at government databases, identified the location of cell towers. And I'll show it here with my crude writing. And they looked at where people lived with respect to those cell towers. I'm, this is my representation of a house. Again, please forgive me. So you have houses, you know where people live, you know where the cell towers are located. And so they found out, identified people who had cancer. And then they found out who died during the period of study. And so they were able to plot the acceleration of cancer. You know, what, what caused people to die within that 10-year peri 10 period is, and do that as a function of their distance from cell towers. So a very meaningful study. This isn't, by the way, on a single cell tower. This is done over 800, over 800 cell towers. So we're not talking about insignificant data or lack of data. This is strong evidence giving you showing where you want to live or not want to live with respect to a cell tower. So let's look at the results here. So the red line is the rate of mortality as a function of your distance from the cell tower. This one right here in the blue line represents the rate of mortality for the population in general. Now, one first thing you look at and you say that it, you want to find out is that as you get farther and farther from the cell tower, your chance of mortality dig, uh, joins that of the population in general, the mortality of the population in general. And as you get close, this is another test for epidemiology, is it dose dependent? In other words, is it the, that the closer you get to a cell tower, the more mortality you have? And the answer is yes, you can see that by looking at the, at the uh, plot. So where did the 500 meters come from? Well, you gotta make a decision somehow. You can't just say you gotta be you know, 10,000 feet away from the antenna, that's not realistic. But there is a break in this curve right here at around 500 meters. That's where it came from. And this isn't just a single study showing that. All the other studies or many, many other studies do support this 500 meters as being realistic for protection against radiation. So having said that, let's go back and look, push this button a lot, at Lenox. If you put the antenna on the Curtis building, Basically, the whole town is within that 500 meters. So it suggests that you might want to consider another site to keep the people in the town safe. Moving right ahead. Um, oh, a one other thing to say here before I move on, and that is I've been mentioning power densities, and that's being kind of like the holy grail of telling whether or not you have safe exposure or not. Please notice that the largest power density measured during the study was 407, 408 milliwatts per meter squared. So this is a study that showed huge significant effects from radiation exposure. And the highest value of radiation they saw in that entire, entire study was this value right here. This is meaningful and I'll show you how that fits into context in just a moment. But before I do, let's say it's also let you know that you're not alone. A lot of people have seen the information that I'm presenting to you right now. And you might want to say, hey, this is, this is huge. What you're showing us is huge. We didn't know that before. How come we haven't seen that before? You'd think that if something like this were true, you'd be seeing it plastered on newspapers all over the place. But please consider. Who are some of the main advertisers for many news outlets, but the telecommunications industry? So people are aware of this, but they're not going to publish it because, or in the newspaper because they don't want to bite the hand that feeds them. They don't want to bite the hand of the, the heavy advertisers. But a lot of people are finding out about it, and so they're putting into place the uh, setbacks. And what are the setbacks are they using? In a lot of cases, they're using 1,500 feet. Now, I do have links here if you are do want to implement some of these uh, setbacks yourself in your town, and I recommend that you do, because kids are the most susceptible to cell phone radiation. But in some of these, they have very detailed uh, ordinances, what the town ordinance looks like, so you could simply cut and paste and make it apply for your town. Some of them are only news releases, but this is a start. There are people who can get you in touch with a lot of other towns. So if you want to do something like this, there are resources available to you. 
Now, how do our FCC standards compare internationally? Now, remember the number I mentioned ago a moment ago, the power density keeps coming up, you know, the watts per meter squared. What, what was that? It was uh, 408 milliwatts per meter squared. So it would be about here. And let's see how that standard compares or how it would fit in for these various countries. Let's see if I can draw a straight line. I did. So <clears throat> within the United States, hey, you're a you're very comfortable. You're very low with respect to the standards set forth by the FCC. Now, however, if you were in Brussels or Bulgaria or Turkey or China, perhaps even Israel, that very high amount of radiation would exceed limits. But in our country, for reasons that I've kind of given some background to, that type of radiation is well within tolerance. You're allowed to do that. So please be very careful when you say that, or hear that something is a small percentage of the FCC limit, it doesn't mean that is going to protect you. So I wanted to raise that issue. And I'll tell why that is in just a moment. Also, that other countries are very good. They, they recognize that there are issues about electrosensitivity and people need to know what the radiation levels are in certain areas. So some countries, these guys right here, but not the, oops, these countries right here, but not the United States, they even publish, they go around, they make regular measurements of radiation in regions, and they publish what, what it is in your region. So if you are electrosensitive and you need to avoid certain areas, you can find that out in other countries, but in, not in ours. So coming up to the question that we <laughs> came to fairly early in the commission is, okay, we've identified problems. There are thousands of peer reviewed journals that show that there's harm associated with radio frequency radiation, RFR. Many other countries have lower thresholds. FCC standards were set in the 1990s. In particular, they're one of their most uh, lasting uh, policies, the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Well, it was <laughs> written in 1996. How have things changed since 1996 in terms of electromagnetics? How many people here had a cell phone? I didn't have a cell phone in 1996. And so the whole landscape, electromagnetic, was very, very different then. And since then, the amount of electromagnetic radiation that we are exposed to has done nothing but increased. That's electrosmog. That affects people. And, and I'll be showing you uh, evidence of that in just a moment as we get to that. So this is part of our thinking process on the commission. Uh, you know, what's going on? We invited the FCC numerous times to come talk with us, you know, as a formal commission. We, the commission, a state commission, have questions, FCC. Please come talk to us and tell us what's going on. They didn't. We sent them emails. They sent us to a website that had that didn't address our questions at all. Questions such as, if uh, the radiation is harmless, how come no insurance company, not even Lloyd's of London, will insure you for that? So they never come. They never showed up. So what's going on with the FCC? Finally, we saw this article right here, and we went, aha, that explains it. So this isn't conspiracy. This is from Harvard University. And notice the title here, how the Federal Communication Commission is dominated by the industries it presumably regulates. So what's going on is they have a revolving door, you've probably heard of that, where people from industry will go up and they'll head the FCC, the FCC heads will come around, work for the telecommunications industry. It's a revolving door. In fact, this said statement from the report kind of sums it up. Industry controls the FCC through a soup to nuts stranglehold that extends from its well-placed campaign spending in Congress through its control of the FCC's congressional oversight committees to its persistent agency lobbying. That's what's going on. That's why the FCC is not protecting us. And this just isn't only the FCC. Many other agencies rely on the FCC because they, why should they be duplicating the efforts of the FCC? It just would cost them money. So you have organizations like the F FDA. They depend on the FCC's proclamations. The World Health Organization. So whatever's going on with the FCC spreads out and it influences what's going on in many other countries also. 
I highly recommend reading this report or at least reading a few pages of it if you want to know more. It's very interesting reading and it's kind of scary reading. I, I don't want to dwell on this too much. It's To me, it's a, a bit negative because it's suggesting that part of our government has been taken over, but that is indeed what's happening. But I need to bring a few other things to your attention because you're likely to hear from people who are going to quote the FCC limits. Oh, we're fine because we're within FCC guidelines, and that doesn't mean squat. So I just want to say a few more things. The Harvard report shows that wireless industry is using a playbook similar to the tobacco, the one used by Big Tobacco. And you, some of you may be familiar with that. I sure am. I've seen doctors on TV smoking cigarettes and uh, proclaiming the benefits, the health benefits of smoking cigarettes. So the what, what part of that playbook is you get lots and lots of money, and we know that the telecommunications industry is loaded with money. <laughs> You're giving it to them. You're, you know what you're paying every month in your, your cell phone bill. And so they have this uh, $26 million in campaign contributions. That certainly gets people on your side. That was in 2016. I understand that it's increased, but I don't have a, a solid reference for that right now. And $87 million on lobbying. They have over 500 lobbyists. They want to make darn sure that their message gets out and nobody else's gets out. Uh, and also, and this is something that you may have to deal with as a town if you have people in from the cell phone industry. Note that they don't have to ha uh, win an, an argument, scientific argument, they can't. They only want to keep this argument going because they realize that there's confirmational bias going on. I don't want to believe that my cell phone is hurting me. I love my cell phone and probably a lot of you do also. So people don't want to believe the harm issue, and so they're willing to believe the FCC in some cases. But I think people are wising up. <laughs> Going back to big tobacco, this is back in 1998. We knew pretty clearly that it did, the, the smoking causes or leads to lung, can lead to lung cancer. And so they were still putting out advertorials claiming that it didn't. Now, here's something also to think about when it comes to scientific debate. I don't know if you know this, but five out of six smokers do not get lung cancer. So does smoking cause lung cancer? Also, for every long-term smoker that dies of a ripe old age, that's a conflicting uh, piece of data. So what you're going to hear from the cell phone industry is that, oh, no, the reports, the science is conflicted. It doesn't uh, show what's going on. Well, I'm going to show you the data. I'm going to provide links to those data so you can decide for yourself whether or not that, what the science shows. So that'll be coming up in just a moment. One other thing i got to show Sometimes we are shown things or told things by the cell phone industry that just cause us to be incredulous, and we can't believe that anybody would try to do such a thing. And I'm going to give you an example of something like that. And here is the CTI, the Cell Cellular Tele Telecommunications Industry Association. They sued Berkeley, California over the ordinance requiring retailers to warn cell phone users about the harms, potential harm. Here's the ordinance. I'm not going to go over it in detail, but basically it says what I said a moment ago. If your cell phone's on, you're connected to a network, don't put it in your pants pocket. Don't put it in your bra. It could potentially harm you. But the, the CTIA sued them over this because they don't want any hint at all that this radiation from cell phones can harm you even though that same information is in your manual for your cell phone. And if you want to see it, you have an iPhone, go to settings, general, legal, and regulatory RF exposure, and buried in there is basically the same statement. So it's there. But the sad part, and the part that shows the power of the telecommunications industry is just recently, this was July 26, a judge ruled in favor of them. I couldn't read the full report myself, but I recommend that if anybody that wants to know about legal gymnastics, go ahead and read what's going on here, what happened with the, the Berkeley ordinance. But I just wanted to give you a sense of what they, the, the telecommunications industry is willing to do to convince you that cell phone radiation is harmless because it allows them to save untold millions of dollars by putting antennas in areas where people are going to become irradiated. Good news. Is there was a lawsuit. This is by the Environmental Health Trust and others. And the main thing is that they just said, that the lawsuit says the FCC ignored the science. Sued them on that. And the wonderful thing here is they won. 
This just happened last Friday. This is a, a time for celebration because it is a chink in the, ar in the armor of the FCC because all of the telecommunication companies had to do in the past was say that we're within FCC limits and they could they had carte blanche to put their towers wherever they wanted. But now the chink in the armor is where it's recognized that what they've been doing is not consistent with valid science. And that's all I wanted to say about that. Now I want to get into the science. So as I mentioned, the commission, the New Hampshire commission brought in nine experts and we started reading peer reviewed articles as a result of that. And so what I'm going to be showing you are slides. I'm going to not dwell on them, but I want to give you a sense of what the science is out there that addresses the effects of cell phone exposure, cell phone radiation exposure. Uh, the, none of these, none of what I'm going to show you are what is from, are from fringe publications because what the FC or the uh, representatives of tel telecom industry say, they say, oh no, the science is conflicted and the only journals that show a problem with cell phone irradiation are from fringe journals. Um, what else do they say about it? Basically that they're, oh, it conflicted and from fringe journals. They're not. And I want to tell, I can talk a little bit about what represents a fringe journal because I've been involved as an associate editor for a scientific journal. Poor quality journals exist, but they're readily identified. Uh, I was an associate editor, as I point out here, and um, for IEEE, for anybody out there that knows about IEEE, I was an associate editor for IEEE transactions on antennas and propagation. So I'm really aware of how journals work. Although I have had questions about what your <laughs> revert or uh, peer reviewed journal is. So I'd like to say a few words about that. So let's say that you have some science that you'd like to publish. So you write it up and you send it into a particular journal where you think it's going to be accepted. It goes to the editor, the editor looks it over, does a cursory look and says, yes, this is a possible for our journal, possible entry for a journal. And then it gets sent to the associate editor who has expertise in the area of the paper. In many cases that would go, I did over 200 papers. And so I would then get the paper, read the paper and says, yeah, th this is worthy of review. And then I would send it out to three experts in the field. These would typically be people from industry or um, from academe that had expertise, recognized expertise in the area of science that the paper was reporting on. So they would then perform their review. They would come back with their recommendation. Yeah, this is worthy of publication or maybe it isn't. I would then get their results and I would decide on whether or not it should be published or not. I forward it to the editor and then it would either be published or it would not be published. That's what peer review is. And all of the papers I'm going to show you are from recognized universities. It's easy to tell if there are some shoddy people in there, people without the appropriate credentials, but I made sure that in the papers that I'm showing you, they were indeed valid publications. So all of the articles I'm going to show you, uh, exposed, uh, show you what happens with exposure to cell phone type radiation. So these aren't articles that show that, you know, somebody being blasted by high levels of radiation. No, these are uh, people or the experiments involving the types of radiation levels that you would get from a cell tower or your cell phone. So let's go into that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you just a handful of, of articles. And I'm going to give you the title. I'm going to show, I give you a link to access it, show you the publication where it was given and just an excerpt from that. And so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. And what I'm doing here is I'm not trying to show you just the, the worst case scenario. What I want to do here is give you, show you that these articles come from a range of authors around the world and address a range of subjects. And so I'm not only going to be looking at one thing like cancer or whatever, I'm going to look at a range of studies yeah. because cell phone radiation isn't just a one the time a problem, one type of problem. It uh, addresses a whole range of issues. So let's get started with that. And you can read these on your own if you'd like to. And it just says that exposure to low level, low intensity microwave radiation like from a cell phone causes an inflammatory response, oxidative stress, and DNA damage in rat brains. Well, if it happens to rats, it's going to happen to us also. So that's the first article. Second one, and here is uh, one that has to do with damage in human ear, hair, uh, can, hair, ear canal hair follicles. 
yeah, it's, uh, is that fringe? No, but if somebody uh, had a study and uh, with a lot of these people simply, they did a study like this because they had the instrumentation to do so. Maybe they were working on hair follicles for other things. And they said, well, let's see what happens when we expose it to radiation. They did, they wrote a paper on it. Now it's available to you if you'd like to read it. This one right here is uh, morphology, that uh, exposure to radiation affects the morphology of skin fibroblast. That's what makes new skin. You don't want to be exposing your skin to something that's going to interfere with its pr production of new skin cells. That's what this one has about, uh, describes. This is a very important article. I'm going to spend a little bit more time with it. This is from Martin Paul, a recognized researcher. And he is looking at the psychological, neuropsychological effects of being exposed to radiation. So what did he define is among the more commonly reported changes are sleep disturbance, insomnia, fatigue, tiredness, concentration, attention, dysfunction, memory changes. Didn't we see this just a few slides ago? This is what the firemen or fire people in the in California experience. Isn't this what's happening to people in Pittsfield? So it's been documented, and you can read about it if you'd like to, but it's just saying what is now be starting to become commonly known. Now, something you should consider here is a lot of us are exposed to radiation. You can get a meter, and I recommend that you get a meter if you can, to show what your exposure is in your house. And after a while, the numbers start making sense. But what I recommend is that if you experience any of these symptoms that I've just shown or were shown right here, Turn off your cell phones, turn off your Wi-Fi router at night and see what happens. I've mentioned this in a number of presentations and people have gotten back to me and they say it's made a huge difference. So it could be that you're getting these experiencing these symptoms from something else. Multiple chemical sensitivity is one of them, or it could be from radiation. And the way to find out, and a pretty easy way to find out, is turn off all sources of radiation and see what happens. You can't hurt you. I and mean, probably it will, it will definitely help you. Moving right along, I said I'd kind of go through these quickly. Uh, we've all read about male uh, infertility. And we've seen plots of sperm count and motility decline over the years, and in fairly recent years too. This is important. Uh, and so where do men typically wear their cell phones? Where do they keep them? In their pockets. So they're exposing the part of them that creates sperm to radiation. So this is the uh, studies have been done to look at how that uh, the imp the impact of cell phone radiation on on these on sp sperm basically. So they would take sperm, I mean, uh, human sperm. In one case, they would radiate it. You know, just put a cell phone near it. I'm, they did it in more controlled ways than that. Take the uh, controlled sperm and do nothing with it, and they found that the significant and the measurable decrease in sperm motility and sperm count. So clearly significant and something that we want to be aware of. So and right here is that, uh, oh, <laughs> they had a couple of high schools uh, and with you know, similar demo de demography. And so they would have students in, in one of the students or the, one of the high schools had about five times the exposure to radiation because of a nearby cell tower than the, what we can kind of call the control school that had lower radiation. And what they found is that they had higher blood sugar in the students exposed to the higher levels of radiation. And that, so and what they found is that the students in the higher radiation group had higher blood sugars, which were kind of precursors to type two diabetes. And we all know that diabetes is becoming almost epidemic in our culture. I'm not saying that that is what caused it, but this is a data point that you should consider if you're looking at causes for type 2 diabetes. <laughs> so not only are people affected, we also have problems around trees and vegetation. So what they found in a study that looked at a good number of trees, and by the way, there are multiple publications about this issue. So you put up a cell tower near trees, and what happens is you start seeing degradation in those trees on the side facing the radiation, and then eventually that works around to the entire tree. And it, it affects vegetation as well. And like I say, there are numerous articles on this, and you can read about it here. So it's not only bad for us, it's bad for the environment and for insects as well. 
Now we all know that pesticides are a problem for insects and that's true. But when you, and, and it turns out that electromagnetic radiation by itself will be, it causes a decline in the insect population. But when you put the two together, you get huge problems for insects and pollinators. And we all know that there's been problems of hive collapse around, and this is, in my opinion, a contributing factor. So that's all that I'm going to, all the articles I'm going to drag you through. But now we got to answer, I have a question that I need to ask and answer for you. Do all the published studies show harm? Am I just, you know, uh, doing cherry picking here to show you only the ones that cause a problem? Well, let me answer that question. And some show harm while others do not. And it depends on who funds the research. I don't think anybody will be surprised with that. So let's go back 11 years. They did a study asking how many of these studies show harm, how many of them do not show harm. So here we go. It turns back, uh, and you can go look at the article. That, yeah, only 28% of one group of studies showed that there was a problem with radiation. And that was that 28% were funded by the cell phone industry. Whereas 66% of the studies that were not funded by the cell phone industry, they showed problems. Now, what happens typically, I've, I've looked at the study of the history of big tobacco and how things move forward in the understanding of the dangers of tobacco. And it started off with very mixed reviews. And when I hear this is kind of mixed that you have 28% uh, showing a only 28% showing a problem, 66% showing a problem from those that are not associated, the studies not associated with the cell phone industry. But generally over time, the real risks come into sharper and sharper focus. So 10 years later in 2020, the list was updated and based on uh, around a thousand studies, and they then, in that case, 73% of all of those studied show a uh, neurological effect of RFR, radio frequency exposure. The genetic problems, only 65%, but still a majority of the studies showed a problem. And fully 90%, and this is one of the bigger concerns right here, showed oxidative damage, which you might know as free radicals. You, you know that they're bad. You don't want free radicals. But free radicals in your body increase with exposure to the electromagnetic fields. And fully 91%, whether funded by industry or not funded by industry, show that there are problems. So did I cherry pick in showing those? No, I, I just showed you ones that are rock solid or seem to be rock solid studies that definitely show harm with exposure. So really this uh, concludes the final, you know, the information that I wanted to present because what I wanted to do is get the information out and then allow time for your, your questions. And so I have some concluding remarks tried to talk quickly so my tongue's getting tired. And that is unpaid citizen experts on a state commission concluded that wireless radiation poses a significant risk to health and the environment. Isn't that what you just heard? None of our commission members, except for those, we had some people on the commission who represented the industry. We had to, to have a fair uh, commission. None of us have financial interest in telecom. Uh, and so we're going to give you our what we an unbiased view, our unbiased evaluation of what's going on. Paid industry representatives, and I'm putting this down because I've seen it. I've given a presentation. Industry people would come in and they would say, "There's absolutely no problem, no science. The science does not justify uh, the the concern at all about radiation exposure." So they they will tell you that if you bring them in. But there is a huge financial benefit, as I mentioned, that if you look at each site and you consider what it would cost to do those, to put those sites in safely, we are talking hundreds of millions of dollars. So there's a huge incentive for perpetuating that myth. So in closing, I just want to say I'm putting in references right here. We'll have an opportunity, I hope, for me to answer questions you might have. Uh, and uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to Mr. Willits. Oh, and I need to give up 